Hello once again this is Mr. Wakefield and we're looking at section 4.4 .4 right now halfway through chapter 4. Um, talking more about logarithms we introduced them in the last section and I'm going to introduce some more logarithm properties. All right, They're actually on the previous worksheet. We're going to look at those first before we talk about this stuff you see here uh, at the top of this page. But I want to make it really clear right off the bat that um, it's really easy as a student to make the mistake when you start first learning about logarithms to kind of um, do the same thing with logarithms that you do with regular polynomial type of problems. For example, uh, if you look down here, just to, just a uh, one example here. See how you got the 16p to the fourth inside of the product term, which I know this is the product term because anytime you have a term, just a single term, next to the little base that's underneath the g right here, that's your product term. All right, not just the 16, but the entire term there. All right, and then if you have a, a plus or minus after that, and it's outside of a parenthesis, outside of a parenthesis, as opposed to being inside the parenthesis, uh, then that is your, uh, it's just the term, uh, 16p to the fourth, that's the product term. This right here is not a part of, of this logarithm right here. This logarithm just has the three as the base, and the 16p to the fourth is the product term. All right, and then anything that's in front of the log is also separate from the logarithm as well. All right, so remember a logarithm has the base and the product term. If you've got just a single term next to the base and there's no bracket around it, just that single term is your product term. Whereas on the other hand, if you've got a parenthesis next to your base there, in this case the base is 6, then the entire parenthesis is your uh, product term. Okay. Uh, so anyway, what I wanted to point out here though, in addition to that is notice that this uh, product term here has a 16 in it. All right. Um, do not think that you can just move the 16 out of the logarithm or, or take the negative three fourths and move it into the logarithm in the same way that you did with polynomials. It doesn't work the same way as it has in the past with other types of math problems. Okay. We are not multiplying negative three fourths times 16 p to the fourth. So you can't just move the negative three fourths in or the 16 out. My overall point here that I want to make in regards to logarithms is Please, when you do logarithms, follow the logarithm rules that we are learning here in Chapter 4. Do not follow any of the rules we've learned at any other time uh, in this class or any other class that's not related to logarithms. All right, when it comes to logarithms, follow just the logarithm rules. All right, so don't be tempted to just move the fraction in or to take the 16 and move it out. Kind of like if you're factoring it in and out. It doesn't work that way necessarily. Now, it does not mean that you can't combine this fraction with the 16p to the fourth. But there is a specific rule that will allow you to do that. That rule we will learn today. Uh, but you got to follow those logarithm rules. I really want to encourage you to remember that. All right. Um, now, speaking of logarithm properties that we do need to learn, logarithm properties that will help us do these, these uh, problems. Um, there's three on the previous worksheet, the 4.3 worksheet here, uh, three additional ones. I probably should have put it on this worksheet because we're going to mainly use them on this worksheet uh, and the succeeding worksheet after this as well, 4.5. But they are right here nonetheless in 4.3. And what I want to point out here, we want to make sure we're reading these uh, three rules here correctly. Um, notice it says... Uh, m times n. So if you've got a product term that is just simply and nothing else, but it is just simply two things being multiplied together, nothing else, then you can use this first property. And it says to take those two things and split them up into two separate logarithms. Notice that the base stays the same as it was over here. If you have just simply a fraction as your product term, nothing else but just simply that fraction, as you can see here, then you can also split it up this time with subtraction instead of addition like we had up here. All right. Um, and again, the bases stay the same. And finally, if you have just a base and an exponent, again, nothing else, but just the base and the exponent as your product term, then um, you can take the exponent and move it to the front, and then just the base is left over as your product term. Okay, so um, let's try to use these properties here, because it says here, use the properties of logarithms, 
Uh, it doesn't mean we're just relegated to just these three properties. There's also these properties that we learned as well, but mainly in these problems anyway, we're going to be focusing on these three. All right, uh, but you might run into some of these as well. Uh, so make sure you know all of these and are ready to use them. All right, we talked about these in the previous section up here, these four. But um, let's start trying to learn how to use these three right now. All right, so this first problem here, it says expand each logarithm as much as possible. All right, the problem is complete when none of the three properties listed above, and I should not say above, I should say what? Uh, it's on the previous sheet. In fact, I've been looking at it with you right here uh, on the 4.3 worksheet. All right, so here we go. So um, what they're saying here is that uh, if you can uh, use one of these three properties, in other words, if your logarithm that you have looks like any one of these three things on the left-hand side, because it's the right-hand side where you actually expand it out, which is what they want you to do. So if any of your logarithms look like one of these three over here, uh, expand it out by doing the corresponding thing over here that it's equal to on this side and that will allow it to expand out all right it'll break down the product term the mn breaks down a m divided by n breaks down it splits apart in other words the mp splits apart all right that's what we want to do so the question is this in the first one do we have just two things being multiplied together in this product term? No, of course not, right? Yeah, that, it is true that there's two things being multiplied together here, but that's not the whole thing. It has to be the entire thing in order to use this property. We got division and we got a, a radical and all that stuff, and we'll get into that. Uh, but uh, it, also, speaking of that fraction, yes, we do have a fraction in this problem, but it's not the entire thing. All right, it does not say that you can do this property when you have a fraction with a radical around it. All right, no, it's just for when you have a fraction only. Okay, so then what about the third property? Well, actually, we can do the third property because remember, you guys, when you have the third root of something, uh, as we reviewed in the last few sections, uh, we know that radicals are related to fractional exponents. All right, we know that when you have, uh, back in the prerequisite review packet, if you've got uh, something to the one-third power, it's the same thing as the cube root. Okay, so if you have the cube root of this fraction, that means what? That means that you can uh, rewrite this as log base P of... Uh, and you got to put this in parentheses right here because when you change it to the fractional power, it has to be um, it has to be written in such a way that uh, the entire inside of the radical has to be um, the base. Now it has to be the thing that's taken to that fractional power, and so you got to use a parenthesis to indicate that. So put a parenthesis around the entire inside of the radical to say that that entire inside of the radical is taken to the one-third power. That's how it works. So now, um, now that we have uh, a, just a base and an exponent here, it's a pretty big base here, it's the entire bracket, but when you have a bracket and an exponent, then that qualifies for this property right here because the M is your base. Uh, the M is the bracket there. Uh, you have a, just simply something taken to a power here. All right. So the bracket then becomes the M. The bracket becomes the M and the one third becomes the P. So what do we do? We take the P and we move it to the front and then the bracket just stays where it's at. Let's try that. So let me write that down. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the one-third in front like I just told you it was going to. That means one-third times, by the way. And um, we get this right here. Okay. So now, 
Can we break down the logarithm we have left over? Can we break it down even more? Yes, we can because again, do one of these three properties qualify? Yes, it does because the second one right here is uh, just a, a, it just says that if you have just simply a fraction and that's it as your product term, you can do this thing right here where you split up the numerator and the denominator. So I can do that here. I can take the, uh, and don't forget to bring over the one third, but I can take the um, the log. I wrote the p a little bit too soon, right there. There we go. I take the two the log and I split it according to the numerator and the denominator. So I get this right here. Like that. Now, here's the thing though. I need to put a bracket around this. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's a square bracket or a round bracket. That doesn't matter. But uh, I need to put a bracket around that because... There we go. Because uh, anytime you take something that's being multiplied by something else and that something goes from being just one term to two terms, and I know this is two terms right here because I have a, a, a minus in between it, just like when you have two normal terms, uh, when you got a plus or minus in between, it it's separates it into two terms. Uh, so if you take something and you split it apart so that it now has either addition or subtraction in between it, you got to bracket that if it's being multiplied by something. Please remember that, okay? That bracket is important in order to get the right answer. Can we take the new, two new logarithms that we created and can we split them up even more? Can we break them? Can we expand them out as the directions say even further? Yes, we can because look at, uh, for example, the first one, it has something times something, doesn't it? It has m to the fifth times n to the fourth. And like the first property says right here, it says that if you have two things being multiplied together, you can expand those out. So I can take... Again, don't forget to bring another one third. That's a part of the answer here. I can take the this single logarithm right here. I'll get to this other logarithm in a minute. But I can take this one right here and I can split it. Please remember, you guys, that the, the bases stay the same all the way through this. That's why I keep on bringing the P letter down here on each one. Uh, but it splits up like this, doesn't it? Like that. All right. Um according to the first property that we just looked at. Then what about this one? Does the T squared split up at all? Yes, it does, because that's just a base and an exponent. So that allows me to take, bring down the minus here first, but it allows me to take the um, two and move it to the front. Like that. All right, we're almost there, you guys. Um, can I take, what what product terms do I have left? That's what we're focusing on. We, we keep on going until we can't do anything with the product terms that I have left. The product terms that I currently have right now are m to the fifth, n to the fourth, and t. Okay, now I can't do anything with t because t is not equal to two things being multiplied together. It's not equal to a fraction. It's not equal to this. Okay, it's just t. But the other two things there fit right into this property right here, okay? The m to the fifth and the n to the fourth, all right? You, it says here that if you have m to the fifth, you can move the five to the front. It also says that if you have n to the fourth, you can move the four to the front. That's what this property is saying. Now, remember, you're just moving it to the front of that logarithm. You're not moving it to the front of the entire problem. You're just moving it. This property here, property number three, says you only move it to the front of the logarithm that uh, it came from. So let's write that out. All right, so if I move it to the front of that... Uh, you would have 5, and then it's just m now. Bring down the plus. The 4 moves to the front like we just talked about, and that's going to make the uh, this just n right here. And then the, we already agreed that the t does not do anything, and there's nothing you can do with that. So we have taken this as far as we can go. Okay, look at what it says here. If, if none of the three properties listed on the 4.3 worksheet that we've been focusing on... Uh, can be used to expand the answer further, then you're done, okay? In other words, uh, the M, the N, and the T, which are the three product terms I have left over in my three logs that I have, if they cannot, uh, if they are not equal to 
two things being multiplied together or a fraction or a base and an exponent, then you know that you've done as much as you possibly can. And so this is the correct answer. Yes, you could distribute that one third out if you want. Um, just remember that if you've got a bunch of logs being added and subtracted together with plus and minus in between them, you distribute it to each part, just kind of like if they were regular terms, you do it in the same way. Uh, but remember, don't ever multiply something that's outside of a logarithm. It's kind of kind of sign, kind of sound like uh, what we do with radicals as well. But it, don't ever multiply something that's outside of a logarithm by something that's inside of a logarithm. So if you do one third times this logarithm, make sure you do one third times five. Okay, and then the log would just go behind that. So like if you distributed this out, it would be five thirds. Again, you do not have to do this step. I'm just saying in case you want to. This would be five-thirds, and then the log just goes behind that. So if you've got a regular term multiplied by a logarithm that has a regular term in front of it, um, you just multiply the outside parts there, uh, and don't put the four or the one-third inside the logarithm. So this would be plus four-thirds, and then the logarithm just goes behind that. And then finally, minus two-thirds, and then the log goes behind that. All right. And so that's also an optional answer, but the first one I circled there is perfectly fine. Let's try that again, you guys. Okay, uh, so once again, what do we have here in number two? We have just a, a, a big, it's a big fraction, but it is just a single fraction as our product term, isn't it? So that means I can use the second property, all right? Again, the second property says that if you've got a fraction, you can split up the numerator and the, and the denominator. Let's do that. Um, so remember the base stays the same, the four, and then um, I'm going to go ahead and put a bracket on this. You, you don't really have to. Um, it's just it kind of easier to read that way. Uh, this is kind of considered a single term in a way. Uh, so like I said, uh, if you don't have a bracket around a single term, everybody's still going to know that that's your product term. But um, it's just easier to read it that way. But that's optional to put that bracket there. Okay. And then what do we do? Then each logarithm now has a product term that is what? It is something times something. Okay. Each one of them has something times something here. Something times something here. And so we can what? We can go like this. I'm going to write a little bit smaller because it's going to get kind of big. Let me, uh, let me uh, zoom in there so you can see it better because it's going to get a little bit small on the writing. Um, so see how I split it up with addition because those things were being multiplied together. That's property number one from the previous worksheet that we've been looking at. Bring down the minus. And then something's going to happen here that we got to be careful about. I'll explain it carefully, but... This splits up into what? Splits up into this right here. Again, the bases stay the same that's underneath the G. Underneath the log there. I need to put a bracket around this. It's the same reason why I put a bracket around this one over here. Okay. You took something that was just a single log and you split it up into two logs that had either a plus or minus in between it. All right. Uh, when you do that, if you are subtracting that logarithm, you guys, just like when you're multiplying, uh, if you're subtracting a log that splits up into two separate logs with a plus or minus in between it, you got to break, you got to put a bracket around that, um, that thing right there because the entire thing has to be subtracted now that entire result there with both parts have to be subtracted as a group and so you need to group it with a bracket again that's when you have sub, uh, a log being subtracted or a log being multiplied like we did here being multiplied by one third you got to bracket the result if that log splits up into two or more logs all right so that's why i bracketed that there uh, now, here's the thing. Remember, again, back in our section when we talked about uh, fraction exponents, uh, we know that when you have um, 
a fraction exponent. Uh, the numerator goes on the outside if the uh, if it's not one. If it's one, you don't need to put it there because something to the first power is not does not need to be written. Uh, but if there's something other than a one on the top, you got to put that out there. But then the denominator is your index number. It tells you what kind of radical you have, whether it's a square root or cube root. All right. So with that in mind, we can't just leave this like this. I know this looks like we're done right now because it doesn't look like any of these three properties that I just pointed out to you. But in reality, it is the third property because when you have a radical, it can be rewritten as something to a fraction power. And so you can't just ignore that. So when you got a radical, just a radical as your product term, all right, you have to rewrite it in these problems as a fraction exponent so that you can then move the fraction exponent to the front of the logarithm. Let's try that right now. All right, I'm just going to rewrite it here first before I actually move the new exponent that I created. Uh, third root of a is going to be a to the one third. Okay. Um, this one's going to be b to the one fourth. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this one's going to be c to the one half because we know that a square root means that. Um, there's an invisible 2 as the index number with the radical, okay? And so it's going to be 1 over 2. So there we go right there. Uh, and then this one right here, this is, um, it's notice it's D to the second and on the inside. Let me just pull that off to the side. I want to show you something here. Uh, D to the, uh, what that is, is it is, um, you got to take, just like I said earlier, if you take the entire inside of the radical and put a bracket around it, you can, yeah, you can do that um, with the one third right here. Just like we did in the first problem where I took the entire inside of the radical and then I did one third because it was to the, uh, it was a third root. It was a cube root. Um, same thing here. But what is this equal to? If I just, uh, I don't want to have two different exponents. I want to have just one because the third property here does not allow for two exponents. It just allows for one there. What is this if I combine this into one exponent? I have to multiply those exponents together the way it's written. When you have a term taken to a power, just a single term, you multiply the exponents and two times one third is two thirds. Okay, so this is d to the, let's bring it down, d to the two-thirds, like that. All right, now, one last thing right here. Um, I can now move all of these exponents to the front of each of their respective logarithms, okay? Um, sorry, I forgot to do it there, excuse me. So you move the one-third to the front of the log of that specific log. Remember, it only goes to the front of the log that it came from. Uh, the one-fourth goes in front of this one. And by the way, you can distribute out this parenthesis if you want. You don't have to, but you can. You know that when you have a minus in front of a, lo uh, in front of a bracket with two terms in it, separated by either addition or subtraction, you can distribute the negative one. But again... When you multiply by negative one, you only multiply what's on the outside of the log. Since there's nothing outside of the log, there's an invisible one right there. So it's like doing negative one times one is negative one. And you, when you write minus, it's as if there's a negative one in front of that log. So you're, you're basically, it's like distributing the negative there. Um, and I forgot to bring the one half to the front, excuse me. But you can, uh, you move the one half to the front but you're also distributing the negative as well. Um, okay, so you're distributing the negative. If there's nothing in front of the log, you're just simply changing the sign of what's in front of the log if there's nothing in front of the log already. Assuming that you're just distributing a negative and there's not a number there in between the minus and the bracket. You're just distributing the negative. It just changes the sign. That's all that it does. So this becomes minus here as well. But then I move the two-thirds to the front of that and I get two-thirds log base four of D, and that is your 
final answer. Lots of stuff going on right there, but that means it's a lot of good practice as well. Okay, that's number two. So you keep on going until you cannot use any of those uh, three properties anymore as the directions here in these problems say. Okay, now number three is very interesting, all right? that's uh, It's really easy to miss this here, you guys. A lot of people will look at this and say, oh, hey, seven times M, I can split that up with the first property. No, you can't. No, you cannot. Why not? It's because the first property says that it has to be only seven times M. Okay, it can't be seven times M plus something. All right. What I'm trying to say here is that, and what is our product term here? It's 7M plus 3Q. We know it's that whole thing because the bracket is around it. As we mentioned at the beginning here, that entire thing because of the bracket, this entire thing right here, 7M plus 3Q, is your product term. All right. Um, and so, is it look like any one of these three things? Is it two things being multiplied together? No. Is it a fraction? No. Is it uh, just a base and an exponent? No. It's not any one of those three things. And so therefore, I cannot use any one of those three properties. And so what we say in that case, since I can't even do anything, is we say that it is already simplified. It is already simplified. All right. And that's all you got to do on that one. Okay. So that is how you expand out a logarithm using those three properties. What we're going to do right now as we go down here is we're going to go the opposite way now. Uh, we are now going to take something that already is expanded out and we're going to condense it back together into a single logarithm. Not just a single logarithm, but with a coefficient of one. What that means is they want a, a single logarithm with nothing in front of it. Because you know that when nothing's in front of a logarithm, that means that there's an invisible one in front of it. And that's what they mean by coefficient one. So you want a single logarithm with nothing in front of it. Can you take these two problems and condense them down so that it'll look like that? Well, how do you do that? What's the strategy you take, first of all? What you do is you now, because we're going backwards, we now look at the right-hand side of these formulas right here. And if it looks like any one of these three things, what we do then is is we then condense the logarithms down to make them look like this right here. See how all these logs have nothing in front of them here? Okay. Um, unlike right here where you got the P in front. Uh, unlike here where you have uh, you don't have anything in front of the logs, but they do. Um, it is more than one log. All right. You want just a single log ultimately. So. If it looks like any one of these three things here on the right-hand side of the equal signs that we have, uh, convert it so that it looks like that. And keep on doing that until you end up with that single logarithm that has nothing in front of it. Let's try that right now. Uh, number four. Number four, I, can, I realize here by looking at this that these two things right here can be broken down to a single or, or condensed down to a single logarithm by using the first property, huh? We've got just a log plus a log, uh, log P and log Q, right? So that says, according to this property, it says to make that into a single log and then just say P times Q. Multiply the product terms together when you condense it. And so let's do that right now. It says log, again, the base stays the same, the little B stays the same right there. And then the P and the Q get multiplied together like that. Okay. Um, this other log is still there. We still got to deal with that. Bring that down still. We haven't uh, done anything with that yet. And then what about uh, what about this now? <clears throat> we now have two logs left over, but now it's log minus log, you guys. Log minus log. And so that falls right into this one right here that's on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Log minus log. So it's telling us to do what? It's telling us to condense it down to a single log where you make a fraction out of those two product terms. All right. The product terms are PQ and R. And so making that into a single log, I get what? I get PQ as a numerator and R as my denominator. You can put a bracket around that fraction if you want, but you don't have to. It's, it's good either way. And you have done it now. You have made it into a single logarithm where there is uh, nothing in front of that log either. And so we did it. Number five, number five. Um, 
here's the thing. You see log minus log, right? And you're thinking, okay, I'll use the second property again. It's log minus log. No, you can't do that. Why not? Not yet anyway. You will eventually, but not yet. Not on the first step. Notice that it says here log minus log. It does not allow for having any numbers in front of the logs. See how in the we have negative three-fourths in the front here, and we got this fraction also in front of this one? Okay, it can't have that. All right. Uh, in order to use this property, you can't have anything in front of the logs. So can we get rid of those fractions there? Yes, we can, because we know that when you have something in front of a log, uh, according to this property right here, you can take that thing in front of the log and move it into the exponent of the current product term that you have. Okay, so let's do that. The negative three-fourths. The negative three-fourths can be moved in, but remember, that is now the exponent for the entire product term. So I need to put a bracket around the product term to make sure that that entire product term is now the base, okay? Because um, that's how that property works, all right? When you move this thing in there, uh, the entire product term that you originally had, 16p to the fourth, is now your base. And so if you don't put a bracket around that, it'll look like just part of it is the base. That entire thing, in other words, has to be taken in the negative three-fourths power, not just the p part or something like that. Okay. Also, and it's a lot easier, by the way, to just leave the minus here. Don't try to move the minus with the two-thirds. Leave that there. Um, but um, here I need to get rid of the two-thirds. Don't need to get rid of the minus because we know that if you have a minus in between your logs, you can still condense it down to a single log, as we just talked about with the with the second property. Uh, so I could just move the two thirds. It's always easier to do positive exponents instead of negative exponents if you can, like that. And so we did it. We made it so that we have just what we have just. Um, a log minus a log, nothing in front of it. So now what? Um, since we now have log minus log, I can now make it into a single logarithm by going like this. In fact, let me make this bigger because it's going to be kind of a big fraction there that we need to simplify. So 16p to the fourth taken to the negative three-fourths power divided by, in other words, you're taking your two product terms and they're becoming the top and bottom of your fraction. That's what you do when you have log minus log. That's what that property says to do. Okay. Now here's the thing. They want us, whenever we have negative exponents, we need to get rid of it. Whenever we have uh, an exponent inside the bracket and an exponent outside, we need to get rid of it, okay? Uh, assuming there's a single term in there, because then you can multiply the exponents and all that, all right? But please, get rid of the negative exponent first. That'll make it a lot easier. The way you do that, and we need to review this, we didn't really see this in the prerequisite review packet, um, what we did see in the prerequisite review packet is we saw that... Uh, if you have just a base, even if it's a bracket, taken to a negative power, you can um, flip that thing over, all right, and it would be the same bracket to the positive three-fourths power. The problem, though, is that, <coughs> excuse me, the problem is that we also have this other thing there. This thing on the underneath it, the 8p to the third taken to the two-thirds power. So that property that you saw back in the prerequisite of review packet, it didn't allow for that. All right, it just said that if you had something to a negative power, even if it's a bracket, so if you've got 16p to the fourth taken to a negative power, you can flip that over uh, the, with the one on the top, the bracket underneath it. With the now you have a, a positive exponent down there. Again, this is from the prerequisite review packet. Um, then um, you could uh, rewrite that and get rid of the negative exponent, but. Because this thing's down here, this is what I'm going to do. 
I'm gonna split the negative exponent along with this base out uh, away from the rest of the fraction there by splitting it apart like you can do this, okay? If you haven't seen this before, all right? If you've got a negative exponent, you take it along with its base and you split it apart from the rest of the fraction there. Sorry about that, there we go. You split it apart from the rest of the fraction like that and then that allows you to flip this thing over. Because remember, um, let me bring this back. If this is over one, you guys, if that's over one, you can still do the same thing because the over one didn't change what this is equal to anyway. So I can flip this thing over and in the same way, I can flip this fraction over like this. There we go. Now we're almost ready to multiply these fractions together, but we can't do that yet because you can't multiply together two things that have uh, that are taken to a power because exponents come before multiplication. So you can't multiply like 16 times 8, for example, when they're both taken to a power. So what you do is you take, um, and I'll pull this off on a piece of scratch paper. You don't have to write down all of this. But um, what we need to do when we have a term taken to a power is you got to take the coefficient to that power, and then you multiply the exponents. Multiplying the exponents is not too bad here. 4 times 3 fourths would be 3, so that would just be p to the third. Same thing over here, 3 times 2 thirds would be p to the second. All right, I'm sorry, I need to make room for the ones on top there, excuse me. So there's still ones on top here. And then you got the p to the third on the bottom, <clears throat> the p to the second on the bottom there, okay. Uh, but um, what about the 16 to the 3 fourths? 16 to the 3 fourths is... The fourth root of 16, as we reviewed earlier in chapter 4, the 3 goes on the outside because it's the numerator, the 4 goes in the index, and this is parentheses come first and then exponents. That's going to be equal to 8, isn't it? So this right here is going to be 8, right there. Okay. And so... Um, that's what you get for 16 to the 3 fourths right there. Oh, what is the other one here? It says uh, 8 to the 2 thirds. We got to do 8 to the 2 thirds. All right, that means that the 3 goes on the inside. 2 goes on the outside. What's this equal to? Parentheses first. And then the exponents, you get the 4. All right, so then that means that this is a 4 right here. Uh, so now multiplying those two fractions together, finally, that's what all of this e is equal to here. I know that's kind of a long process there, all right, but uh, they don't want to have negative exponents and they don't want to have the more than one exponent here. Uh, exponent, uh, they don't want an exponent on the inside and one on the outside. So we that's why they wanted us to do all that. Um, what does this all become here? If I multiply these two fractions together, this would be equal to 1 over 32p to the fifth. 1 over 32p to the 5th. So that's your final answer right there would be the logarithm. 1 over 32p to the 5th is your product term. Okay, again, you don't have to put a bracket on this, but I will. I like to do that with fractions a lot of the time. Um, but we did it. We made it into a single logarithm. Okay, a single logarithm with nothing on the outside of it. We just needed to simplify that uh, that. Um, that fraction that we had there because of the negative exponent and because they don't want, again, uh, a uh, exponent on the inside and an exponent on the outside. They want you to combine that. All right. Okay. So that is how to use those three properties to not only expand out your logs like we did in the first three problems, but also condense them down into a single logarithm. What we need to do right now is to realize, uh, moving on here to the next part, we need to realize that um, 
these properties right now that we learned in 4.3 um, are the same as these properties that are at the top of our worksheet right now. They really are. Okay, we just need to realize that when there is no G, when there is no base underneath the G right there, that means, see how there's no base right here in this example up here at the top? Okay, if there's no base next to the G, then that means that that base is 10. That base is 10. Okay, it's kind of like when you have a square root, all right, and you don't need to write you know, how you, like when you have a square root right here, you don't need to write the little two right there. Uh, whereas if it's a cube root or a fourth root, you got to write the three or the four. Um, well, uh, with um, it's the same uh, idea here where uh, just like the two is invisible with square roots, the ten is invisible right here. Uh, there's a lot of things that are invisible in math, all right, and this is one another one of those many examples. Um so if you take this, uh, if you take each one of these four properties that we already learned in the previous section and you make that a 10 right there, you make each one of these little B's into a 10, all right, then these are the same properties that you have right here. So you don't need to learn a whole new set of properties just so long as you know that uh, there's an invisible 10 next to the G on each one of these, then all you got to know is these properties here and you'll know that each one of these things is equal to 0, 1, x, and x, all right? You'll know it already if you know these properties, all right, and you know that that uh, invisible base is 10, all right? One other thing that we need to learn for the first time is this thing called ln. ln, uh, and we talked about briefly about uh, the letter E in the previous, in the previous uh, section, um, the letter E, we talked about it's equal to 2.71828 approximately. You don't need to worry about that too much right now. But that is a, a number that's a used a lot. It's used a lot in math. And so that's why we have this thing called LN. LN uh, is the same thing as log base E of X. Log base E of X, as you can see there on your worksheet, I know that E is really small there, but it's on your worksheet. It should be in front of you. That little E, when it's, uh, when, uh, that's your little base next to the G, they like to shorten it down to just saying LN of X. Okay. And you don't need to write a little E underneath that because it's already known that whenever you say LN, that the base is E automatically. And so, again, if the base is E right here, then these properties are all the same, okay? If the, uh, if the product term is 1, then this is 0, just like right here in this one. If the product term is E, then since the base, which is an invisible E, and the product term, the E and the E are the same, just like the B and the B are the same, it's going to be 1. Okay, uh, same thing here, the little base that's invisible is E, so you got E and then E to the X, it's just like having B and B to the X, all right? Uh, same thing here, E and then log base E, it's just like having B and log base B, okay? All the same things, it's just you need to realize that uh, the invisible base is E whenever you have LN, okay? All right. With that in mind now, we're going to do something that we did in the previous uh, section. We're just going to get used to doing it with, with logs uh, now that have these invisible bases. We know that uh, when the, and you don't have to write this down, but as long as you're thinking this in your mind right here, you're thinking, hey, uh, I know that LN is the same thing as log base E right here. I know it's the same thing. Uh, then I know that uh, this is what? This is... Um, just like we did in the last section, when you are asked to evaluate a logarithm, all right, you want to do this. You want to say e to what power? In other words, you take the base next to the g and you say to what power is, does that make it equal to the product term, which is e to the 5.8 power? Well, you know that uh, that property that we had, you know that A, B, A, C formula that we had in the last section, all right, if you can make both sides of the equation look like this, then you know that you can cancel out those E's right there, all right? And then our answer then is the question mark then must be equal to 5.8 automatically. Because um, just like right here, AB equal to AC, that automatically means that the exponents have got to be equal. Well, so then the question mark must be equal to 5.8. Again, we did this a lot back in uh, section uh, 4.3. And so the answer here is 5.8 automatically.
Um, same idea here. Again, you don't have to write this down, but I'm just getting you used to the whole idea here. Uh, it's log base E when it's LN. Log base E. And so um, what does this mean? This means that uh, when they want you to evaluate a logarithm, you take the base that's next to the G there, the base that's next to the G, and you say to what power uh, is it equal to this? Well, as we learned back in that same section, uh, 4.3, we know that when we have 1 over uh, base and an exponent, we can rewrite that as e to the negative 4, can't we? e to the negative 4. And so we use that same property again right here, and it makes us realize that the question mark is equal to negative 4 because the e's cancel out when it looks like this right here. So question mark uh, it was what we were trying to figure out it's the it's what the uh, entire logarithm is equal to and so that must mean that the logarithm is equal to negative four because the question mark is equal to that yeah. now these next two problems are a little bit different this is where we're going to bring our calculator into the into the mix here um, we have what here we have it says here logarithm of 94 that means what that means log base 10 again you don't have to write it if you already know the 10 is there I'm just getting you used to remembering that there's an invisible 10 there that's all this means what though this means that 10 to what power is equal to 94 okay we got a problem now <laughs> this is the first time we've seen this all right um, I can't make it look like this if this was a 100 right here, then I could uh, then I could say, okay, I'm going to change that so that it's like 10 to the second power. Can't do that here. As I promised you guys in 4.3, there was going to come a point here in these problems where we were going to run into this problem where you can't uh, change the 94 to have a base of 10, and you can't change the 10 to have a base of 94. All right? You can't do that. You can't make it look like this. All right, um, and so what do you do? Well, thankfully, our calculator will help us out in this case because our calculator can figure out the log base uh, 10 of 94 without even having to do any of this work. Okay, I just wanted you to. Sh I just wanted to show you uh, that uh, this other way that we've been doing it will not work before I actually brought out the calculator. But the calculator can just knock it out right off the bat here for you. Okay, now since we're using our calculator and since this will give us a big, huge, nasty decimal answer that covers our entire screen, which means it's going to be rounded off when that happens, whenever it covers your screen, your entire screen, that's why the directions say to round it to four decimal places. All right, it will give you that uh, situation where it'll cover your whole screen. Let's take a look at what happens. When you have a logarithm, base 10, not other bases, and I'll get into that, don't worry. But when it's logarithm base 10, this log button on your scientific calculator right here, okay, this one right here, where it just says LOG, that one will tell you what the answer is. If you've got one of these, these two-line calculators where the question is on the first line and the answer pops up on the second line, usually that means that you put the log first, you put in the 94 inside the bracket, but make sure to close up the bracket, and it gives you that answer right there. What does that round it off to uh, four decimal places? It would be 1.9731, and then the next digit is less than five, and so the one stays the same right there. Let me write that down right now. That means... Um, that means that... Uh, um, that's the uh, exponent, okay, because a log is equal to an exponent, all right? That means that 10 to that power is equal to 94, all right? Um, how do you take something to a decimal power and get, and get something, okay? You don't, but uh, remember that decimals can be rewritten as fractions, and we know how to take something to a fraction power, okay? It uh, doesn't mean we're going to have to do that with this kind of decimal. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that I'm just trying to make sense of uh, this idea of having a decimal power because you're not used to having a decimal power, are you? Okay, that's not something we normally do. But since decimals are equivalent to certain fractions, all right, um, it does make sense to have a decimal exponent. All right, so don't be alarmed by the fact that your log is equal to a decimal and because you know that a decimal... 
uh, uh, is uh, not normally an exponent, and a log is supposed to be an exponent. Don't be alarmed by all that, all right, uh, because decimals are the same as fractions, all right, if you convert them. And fraction exponents are completely normal. They're not as normal as, let's say, a whole number, but they're normal. Okay. Another thing, oh, by the way, if you have a one-line calculator, that's perfectly fine, as I've talked about before. But the way you do it is the opposite. You put the 94 into your screen first. There it is right there. Enter the 94. Then you hit the log, and it automatically gives you the same answer. You don't have to hit the equal sign after that. It gives you the same answer as you can see here. Okay. So, um just wanted to make sure that you were covered there. Uh, number nine is the same, except for since it's LN, you do exactly the same thing you did in number eight, except for you use the LN button that, that you should also have on your scientific calculator. On this one, it's right here. Okay, but no matter what scientific calculator you have, you should be able to find it. And then you enter it the same way that we entered um, the previous problem. All right, so let's see how this goes. It says uh, this uh, this decimal here is 0 0.0077. All right, there it is right there. And then you hit the LN button right here. And there it goes. On this calculator, you don't even have to hit the equal sign. And rounding off to four decimal places right here, we get what? We get negative 4.8665. There we go. All right. Very good. Um, again, it's okay that it's negative. Uh, exponents are equal to logs, and so we know that this represents an exponent right here. But we know that there's negative exponents in the world, so again, don't be alarmed by that. It can be negative. That's all right. Okay. Um in the previous video. Uh, now looking on the back side, we have um, a couple of word problems here related to earthquakes, which certainly is uh, uh, an interesting topic if you live in California. Uh, you hear about uh, Richter scale readings uh, on a regular basis in this state. And uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, how they compute that and how one, for example, how one Richter scale reading differs from another. For example, uh, let's say that you have an earthquake that measures 4.0 on the Richter scale, but then say the following year, let's say you have another earthquake that measures 5.0. In other words, it's exactly one point higher. Uh, what does that mean? What is the, the difference between those two earthquakes uh, based on 4.0 versus 5.0? That's a, that's a very uh, uh, interesting thing to know uh, when you live in an earthquake state like ours. And so let's talk about um, how to figure that out. Now let's jump into this problem here first and then I'll help her reveal what that's all about. Uh, it says the magnitude of an earthquake measured on the Richter scale is this logarithm right here. That That's how they measure the magnitude, all right? Um, uh, it, logarithms play a big part in earthquakes. Where I is the amplitude, okay, registered on a seismograph. Amplitude is how high those waves go on a seismograph and whenever you see one on TV, all right, uh, and all of a sudden the big, the big needle starts moving up and down, all right, that's the amplitude on the seismograph. Um, and assuming the seismograph is 100 kilometers from the epicenter of the earthquake, just for the sake of argument here. And then that little I naught number, which is the denominator, let's say that that's the amplitude of a, just some very small earthquake, just to have something to compare. Okay, what would be the Richter scale reading for earthquakes having the following amplitudes? In other words, what if you had an earthquake that was 1,000 times the size uh, or times the magnitude? Okay, magnitude measures the size of the earthquake. It, it, it was 1,000 times the magnitude or size of that small earthquake that we're comparing it to. What would that do to the Richter scale reading? Let's uh, imagine that the Richter scale reading uh, for that small earthquake, just as a comparison, let's just uh, say that it was zero okay 0, 0.0 it was so small it just didn't do anything uh, how would uh, this uh, one compare to that uh, well what you do is you just simply take these three problems that they want you to do right here a B and C and they want you to plug it into the I right here all right because I is uh, supposed to be the amplitude like it says 
All right, so all I'm gonna do right here, real simple, and you don't need to write down the little 10 right here, but uh, it's written right here. Again, when it's 10, it doesn't need to be written, so it's up to you. But uh, if I plug in 1000 I naught, I get this right here. But because these are both single terms, I'm allowed to cancel these with no problem. Okay, so I get what? I get log base 10 of 1000. Okay, what is log base 10 of 1,000? Isn't that saying uh, 10 to what power is equal to 1,000? Okay, 10 to what power is equal to 1,000? Let me write that down here. You don't have to write this down if you already know the answer. But 10 to what power is 1,000? We know that 10 to the third power is 1,000. Okay, and so the answer is going to be 3. That means that the Richter scale um, would then be... Um, 3.0 in that case, okay? Um, and what that means is that uh, it's also a thousand times bigger of an earthquake as that small one that didn't register at all in the Richter scale, uh, the I naught one, okay, where the Richter scale reading was just zero. Okay, you might be thinking, oh, big deal, though, because we don't even know what, uh, if it's not, a, if we're comparing it to something that's uh, measures 0.0, .0 what's the big deal about that? Well, that's where we're going to get into the, these other ones will help reveal how earthquakes compare to each other a lot better, though. Okay, so be patient with me here. Let's do these other two first. The other two are just done the same way. And again, you don't have to write down that 10 right there if you don't want to. <clears throat> Again, the I knots cancel. We do the same thing over here. The I knots cancel. Plug in. Just make sure you have the right number of zeros here. Okay. Um, there we go. So the I knots cancel on both of these because the top and the bottom of the fraction is just a single term. And so we end up with log base 10 of a million, and I know that's a million because it's got six zeros. A million has six zeros. And this right here, how many zeros? That has eight, so that would be 100 million. Um, you know that anytime you have a whole number, you guys, where it's just the number one followed by a bunch of zeros, um, and if somebody said, hey, 10 to what power is equal to that, okay, that would be determined by the number of zeros. Okay, that's the reason why this answer was three. It's because a thousand has three zeros. So since this one has six zeros, all right, this answer would then be this answer would then be six. So that would be a Richter scale reading of six. All right, this one would be. Um, sorry, I didn't even need to write down log again there. Because this one has eight zeros, this is a really big earthquake, all right? This one's going to do serious damage. This one's a Richter scale reading of eight, okay? It, what I want you to realize here is that every time you tack on a zero, this number is going to go up by one, isn't it? Okay, if it had been four zeros, then the Richter scale reading would be four. If there was five zeros, it'd be five. If it's six zeros like we got here, it's six. So what I want you to realize is that each time an earthquake increases by uh, one point on the Richter scale, that means that the uh, magnitude increases by 10. In other words, the size of the earthquake increases by 10. All right, that's a pretty big increase if you think about it. All right, so it tells you uh, about how uh, Richter scale readings compare to each other. So to go back to that original question that I asked, um, what is the difference between a 4.0 earthquake and a 5.0 earthquake? The difference is that the 5.0 is 10 times bigger in magnitude. Okay. Um, let's move on here to number 11. Uh, you may remember in the news, uh, or if you... If you're too young, or maybe you just don't remember, all right, it says it was 16 years ago at the time I filmed this video. Uh, there was a very huge earthquake uh, uh, off of the Indian Ocean uh, that led to a tsunami that was extremely destructive, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's what they're talking about here. Uh, the earthquake was an amazing 9.1 on the Richter scale. You don't normally see an earthquake uh, that's that high anywhere. It's very, very rare. Um, 
and it caused a tsunami that uh, did all this destruction. Uh, so what are they asking here? They're saying the resulting tsunami, oh, we already talked about that. It says express this reading uh, in terms of I. In other words, the reading on the Richter scale. What they want you to do is they want you to figure out, uh, kind of go backwards from what we did in the last problem, the last three problems. Uh, they want to know what the I is. What's the uh, magnitude in comparison to I naught? Okay, so what is I? And you can round that to the nearest hundred thousandths. Okay, to the nearest hundred thousandths, which is the, I'll show you what that is. Nearest hundred thousandths. Okay. So, here's what we do. Going backwards now, we now know that the 9.1 is this number right here, and it's got to be equal to that log formula we have up here. All right. Uh, so, that means that 9.1 is equal to log base 10 of I over I naught. All right. Um, and so... How do we figure out uh, what that I is equal to there in terms of I naught? You don't have to figure out I naught. Um, you just have to figure out the uh, uh, the I part. Um, remember these problems in 4.3. If you have a logarithm, you guys, equal to just a single term on the other side, you can figure out uh, what's going on with that. You can solve that equation by... Um, by rewriting it in this form right here where the base and the exponent go together and then the product terms by itself. We're going to do that same thing here. Let's try that right now. The base and the exponent are 10 and 9.1 because again, remember the logarithm is equal to the exponent, so that's why the 9.1 is the exponent. And then the product term is going to be by itself. Okay. Now, I can then multiply, or I can even cross-multiply, actually, because both sides can be made into fractions here. I can then cross-multiply, and I get, um, you don't have to figure out what the 10 to the 9.1 power is equal to yet. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, I times 1 is I. I'm cross-multiplying. 10 to the 9.1 power times I naught is uh, on the other side of the equal sign. So they want to know well, what is this reading in terms of i naught. So they just want to know uh, uh, that i is equal to something times i naught. In other words, i naught can be in your answer. That's what they mean when they say in terms of i naught. I naught can be in your answer. So they want to know uh, uh, what is i equal to, and i naught can be in that answer there. So all you got to do then is just say 10 to the 9.1 power. 10 and then do uh, your exponent however that works on your calculator and as always let me know if you're having trouble figuring out your calculator in any kind of way um, but 10 to the 9.1 power is this right here okay when they said round off to the nearest hundred thousands they were talking about uh, the nine place right here okay so um, the nine place uh, since the next digit from the 9 is uh, less than 5, then that means that uh, the 9 will stay the same and then everything else becomes zeros, just like you normally do when you round off. All right. Take the place that you're rounding, round it, okay, and then everything else becomes zeros after that. So we end up getting this answer right here. All right. If I round off, I get 1, 2, 5, 8, 9. And then after the 9, everything becomes zeros, like I said. The i naught is still there behind it. I'm just rounding this off. I'm going to put the squiggly equal sign there. It's not required, but whenever you round off, the squiggly equal sign indicates that that's approximation. That's an approximation because you round it off. Not required, but I like to do that sometimes. Okay. Equal sign is fine, though. Okay, so that is earthquakes, all right, and how they relate to logarithms. Last thing we need to do the, on this 4.4 uh, section is we need to talk about uh, what happens, um, again, if you are asked to evaluate a logarithm, uh, 
and which as you know means this right here it means two to what power is equal to nine. Oh, but I can't figure that out though okay it's not again it's you can't do what we did back in 4.3 where uh, you can change the nine to have a base of two you can't change the two to have a base of nine you tried but you just can't do it uh, so then you might be thinking to yourself, oh yeah, on the front side of the worksheet, what did we do? On the front side of the worksheet, we just put it into our calculator when we weren't able to figure that out. But there's a problem. Okay, Put it in your calculator will work if the base is 10 or if the base is E. If the base is equal to 2, your calculator does not know how to do that. Okay, If your base is 1 third, doesn't know how to do that. If your base is square root of 19, again, your calculator only knows how to do base 10 and base E. So what do you do? There is this formula. It's on the front side of your worksheet. Okay, let me pull it up here for you. you look at it side by side here. Called the change of base formula. You are going to change the base from 2 to, and it's your choice, you can either change it to base 10. See how these two logarithms are both base 10 because you don't see a base next to the G there? Or you can change it to this fraction where both of them are base E because it says LN. That means it's base E. Both of these fractions will give you the same exact answer. So your choice, okay, you'll be good either way. And then you just have to figure out what the fraction is equal to. Remember, the old base becomes the new product term on the bottom. Base on the bottom. That's how I remember it. Base goes on the bottom. Base bottom, all right? So the the old product term stays as the new product term, but it goes in the numerator. But base becomes a new product term on the bottom. Base bottom, all right? So, and that's for both of these fractions. Base goes on the bottom. Let's try it out, you guys. Um, I'm going to try that first fraction. But the second fraction, like I said, will work. But this changes the base on both of these logarithms to um, base 10, which means I can put it into my calculator. Now, the way you enter in your calculator is different depending on whether or not you got an old-fashioned one-line calculator or one of the two-line calculators. I'll do one at a time here. Give me a chance here to do the, the first one here first. Okay. Uh, when you do this one, like I said earlier, if you're trying to figure out a logarithm, you got to put the product term in first, then you hit the log. There is the what the numerator is equal to. Keep that on your screen. Divide that by log base 2. And again, the way you enter that in your calculator is you hit the 2 first and then the log. Now this time, you have to hit the equal sign because this is just equal to the log base 2. This is just equal to the denominator. So you got to hit the equal sign, and that is your... Uh, answer right there. They want us to round off the four decimal places in the directions there, and so that is going to be approximately equal to 3.1699. You put that in your two-line calculator right here. Okay, again, it's very similar to the way you did log earlier, okay, where you hit the log first. Then you put the 9 in there. Remember to always, very important, you close up that bracket right there. Okay, if you forget to close up that bracket, the denominator will then go into this logarithm on the top. You can't do that. Okay, the logs have to stay separate. So your product term, once you're done writing down your product term, and 9 is the only product term for the log on the top. It's the only thing. All right, so as soon as you're done typing in the product term, you got to close up that bracket. Otherwise, your calculator will completely misunderstand you. Then you hit divided by, of course, and then you do log 2. Again, close up that bracket when you're done typing in the product term for that log. And then you hit the equal sign, and you can see it gives you the same exact answer. Same exact answer. Let's try that again. This time, just for the heck of it here, though, let's try it for um, the other fraction. It'll give you the same answer. So... LN of 2 divided by LN of 1 third. Okay, so let's see how this comes out here on the one line calculator first. Uh, uh, you say 2 LN. Now you got to be careful here on the second part here. When you have a one line calculator, uh, similar to the two line calculator, you need to, when you have a fraction, you don't need to do it with just a simple number like 2, but when your product term is a fraction, you need to use your brackets here. You can see that the one line calculators have them. Okay, you say bracket. 
one divided by three, but you got to remember to close up your bracket, just like the two line calculator. So hit the uh, right hand bracket like that to close it up. Then hit the LM button and that will tell you what the denominator is equal to again, just like in the last problem. Okay. It tells you what the denominator is after you hit LN, but then you hit the equal sign and it gives you the final answer there. Okay, so what is that? That is negative uh, 0 0.6309. Negative 0 0.6309. The two-line calculator will be the same. All right. You enter uh, LN2. You just do the same thing we did on the previous problem where... Um, you would hit, say, 1 divided by 3 inside of the bracket, okay? And you should get that same exact answer. And as always, let me know if you're not. All right, uh, the final one here. I'll go back to the first fraction, but it really doesn't matter. They're both going to give you the right answer. We got log base 5. I'm sorry, log uh, product term of 5. And then log product term of square to 19. Okay. On the one-line calculator... What would that give you there? All right. Um, five log divided by, and remember when you do square root of 19, you got to do 19 before the square root. Then you hit the log. All right. And again, that when you hit the log on the bottom, it just gives you the denominator. And then you hit the equal sign, and it gives you the correct answer. One point. 0932. The two line calculator is similar again. You just have to put the square root of 19 into your calculator. Okay. Um, so we got what? We got log 5. Close that up after you enter in the 5 there, like we talked about. Log, and then you hit, uh, like you guys do with the two line calculators, you always hit the square root before the 19. Now notice that the Got to be really careful here. They, they always like to open up a bracket for radicals as well. So you got to close up the bracket for the radical, but you also got to close up the bracket for the log after that. So there's a bracket for the radical and a bracket for the log. You need to close up both of those. Now it'll give you the same correct answer once again. All right. So just want to make sure you're entering this in your calculator correctly. Obviously, that's important. All right. And so that is uh, the change of base property. So that concludes section 4.4. Let me know as usual if you have any questions. You have a good day and take care.